we have perhaps 28, maybe 29 existing Greek tragedies. Presumably, there were many more. There were festivals every year for quite a period, which, wherein every playwright would enter three uh, tra uh, tragedies plus a uh, satyr play to go along with them. Uh, given that Medea, when it was produced by Euripides, came only third, that means that for that year, there were at least nine great tragedies, or Greek tragedies, I should say. Whether they were great or not, hard to know. We don't have them. We have one from that year. Sometimes we get a few more, but seldom. Prometheus Bound is one of those remaining 28 or 29 tragedies, and it's attributed to Aeschylus, the first great uh, playwright that we still have uh, work belonging to. He's a master, as I've said before on here, and he's um, he is unparalleled in many ways in his time. But I want to look at who or how Prometheus Bound came about. Now, according to various sources at the time, it was a, one of a trilogy of Promethean plays, by all, uh, according to the sources, by Aeschylus. This was known as the Prometheia, like the Oresteia, or maybe the Prometheia. And it, uh, this one was, uh, this play, Prometheus Bound, was followed by Prometheus Unbound and Prometheus Pyrphorus, or Prometheus the Fire Carrier, or Fire Bringer. Um, for Unbound and Pyrphorus, we only have fragments remaining of them. We don't have very much at all. There are 11 fragments that remain of Prometheus Unbound and one that remains for uh, Pyrophorus. Now, in the absence of more fragments, it has kind of uh, led to Prometheus Bound being this great pillar and we have this sense of what, what came after. In the 19th century, in the Romantic era, uh, it had, it was possibly the single most popular of the Greek plays. Now, this is a period during which we're not really seeing them produced very often. Occasionally, you'll see Oedipus or Medea, but in terms of the scope of all of them, you're seldom seeing anything else. But Prometheus Unbound is hugely popular in the early 19th uh, century, and pretty much right up to the 20th century. It had a number of supporters uh, who saw it as a possible beacon. Uh, it is said by some that, you know, you tell me what you think of Prometheus Bound and I will tell you your politics. Uh, those who were, let's say, authoritarian would see Prometheus Bound as being a really good play because it shows that pun strict punishment will be given to those who fail to obey the rules. If you are, let's say, liberal or romantic, you're going to take the same kind of thing like Prometheus Bound. Oh, look, this great guy, he gave of himself for us. What a legend is that Prometheus guy. So you get a different angle on the play depending on who you are and when you are. Um, at that time, revolutionaries in the first half of the 19th century loved it. It particularly uh, fanned the flames of intellectual revolutionaries. People like uh, Byron and Shelley, who while they weren't around by the time of the 1848 revolutions, would have been big uh, supporters of them. Shelley in particular was a very big fan. He wrote a version of it himself uh, he, uh, that as a play for reading rather than for performance, a chamber play as they used to call them. And he wrote Prometheus Unbound. In his preface to it, he talks about how Aeschylus has such prescient qualities in Prometheus Bound and the thought of reconstructing Prometheus Unbound as in the style of Hesiod's legend, uh, Hesiod being the guy who wrote the Theogony, which is the, uh, the story of the gods. But the thought of reconstructing uh, uh, what may be the uh, Aeschylean Prometheus Unbound filled him with uh, distaste. In the sequel, according to Hesiod, Prometheus, the liberator, the firebringer, is reconciled with Zeus, who is the oppressor of man, who really only wants to use Prometheus for his power to overcome his enemies. This, of course, was completely abhorrent to Shelley, 
who found Aeschylus's uh, Prometheus Unbound possibly distasteful. His Prometheus Unbound diverged from the legend it was meant to mirror. But not only in story, it also followed the style of the original Prometheus Bound very well. There's not very much movement. There's little motion. It's almost Seneca-like in the focus on the words and their meanings. Little really happens in Prometheus Bound. There he is, Prometheus. He's brought in by power and violence and by Hephaestus, and he is chained to a rock. And after the spike goes in, there he is for the rest of the play. People come and say, oh, this is terrible, man. This is not good. Uh, and then they depart. And all that Prometheus does really is, I presume, struggle a little bit, but he foretells the future. He talks of Zeus's need for help, of Heracles coming to free him. And apparently, according to what we know, this is what happens in Prometheus Unbound. Heracles comes in, Zeus needs his help, and together they unite. And Prometheus the Firebringer, Pyrphoros, presumably, again, as we can tell, is the sort of the, well, here's what happened earlier kind of thing. The third part of the trilogy, maybe he goes back to his firebringing duties. I don't know. We have one fragment, and it's not telling us an awful lot. The Promethea has been attributed to Aeschylus for centuries at this point. It's largely based on the non-contemporaneous reports of his plays. Now, apparently, after Aeschylus' death in 456 BCE, his son Euphorion, who himself was a playwright, and ta talented enough, he's uh, reputed to have won at the play festival, I think it's four times. He, Euphorion, went on to produce his father Aeschylus' work in another three festivals after his death. And... Given that it was a three tragedy, one satyr play thing that you were expecting from the festivals, that's to say that there were 12 plays produced posthumously. Presumably, after he, when he died, Aeschylus left us with 12 plays. Now, increasingly, more and more scholars do not believe that Prometheus Bound or the Prometheia is the work of Aeschylus. Let's compare what we know uh, from what exists, the six, the, the six other plays that remain. Generally, in all these plays, they're kind of on the cutting edge of theatre. If you look what's contemp uh, what's happening in theatre at that time, um, he's doing what's done. He's the guy who came up with the idea of a second actor. But when Sophocles comes up with the idea of a third, he's gone, yep, we'll do that. So he's always kind of at the edge. Uh, only one of his plays has a non-human character in it, and he never really uses them. Athena in the Eumenides is the only non-human character who shows up in any of his plays. Um, these plays, because of that, they all tend to looking towards human matters. What's going on in the world as we know it today, and what's, how we as humans deal with our fates, uh, particularly as we are often dashed by the whims of the gods. And there's a really sophisticated use of movement. Most of these speeches are in sync with some movement or suggest some movement. Uh, I think of the watchman even at the beginning of um, the Aristia, at the beginning of Agamemnon, who is looking to hi hither and yon, looking for that uh, sign from the world that here comes Agamemnon. Now, in contrast, we open with Prometheus, where there is some movement at the beginning, where uh, we, we open with a titan, the race of gods before Zeus, and he's being in, uh, spiked in, in place in less than 90 lines by other titans and other uh, emissaries of the gods. Now, it seems to me to be less sophisticated than the Aristia, to be honest. I mean, its key character is literally chained to a rock for the entirety of the play. Uh, you get like 80 lines or 90 lines at the beginning, and that's it. We've got, uh, we've got our man in place. Um, and while humans, or the love of humans rather, cause the action of the play, there's no real place of humanity there, except in the most metaphoric terms. In so many ways, you could say that this trilogy is much, and, or 
presuming that the other parts follow through on this, that this trilogy would be more in keeping with the medieval miracle plays, where with characters named for abstract ideas, like we've got power and violence, uh, for example. Um, and, and we've got these gigantic men who are called titans. So, you know, it's a case study in a very generic term of how do things work? And it doesn't really feel like any of the other existing works of uh, Aeschylus, to be completely honest with you. Uh, my understanding of them is a very human places that are very much about humans. Now, that said, we believe he wrote between 70 and 90 plays. And we have arguably, if you follow this argument, only six of them remaining. It's hard to say what the other plays are like. I mean, imagine if you like that he wrote four great trilogies with the accompanying satyr plays. That's 16 plays, all in the kind of the style of the Oresti and what have you. So based on that, you would have 16 plays out of a lower end figure of 70. So we've got 54 plays uh, left to account for. This would give him space to write the Prometheia. He'd also write the ancient Greek version of the movie Showgirls, all 46 episodes of Joey and maybe a season of Faulty Towers. Let's say he'll write the second one, which isn't quite as good as the first. So that brings us up to 70. So we're trying to figure out, what I've just been doing is trying to figure out who he is based on a sample of maybe less than 10% of his plays. Now today, we often talk about Euphorion, uh, his son, being the writer of the Prometheia and perhaps the other plays. There is a history of people claiming to be other authors uh, in order to cash in on it. And Euphorion was a pretty decent writer. Uh, apparently the structure is similar in many ways to the work of um, the earlier Aeschylus. But it is perhaps a copy? I don't know. Personally, I fall towards the feeling that Euphorion is the writer of the Prometheia, Prometheia, but I'm not a scholar. And I know there are plenty of scholars, who, and I don't feel all that aggressive about the matter, whereas there are plenty of scholars who do. Uh, the guy who produced this particular uh, version of it, which is Michael Evans, an Australian uh, scholar, feels really aggressive about the matter that, no, 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 this isn't Aeschylus. And it kind of tickles me, and I feel sad for him at the same time, that we're not starting to publish the books of Euphorium because there's literally one existing full play that we know of. So every time Prometheus Bound is being uh, printed and bound into a book, it's under the name of Aeschylus. So all these scholars who've spent all their time figuring out, yeah, it's Euphorian, it's not Aeschylus, they've got to be frustrated. <laughs>